Okay, I'm talking about my favorite topic, it's logging and monitoring. Uh, I'm from Zemmatext and my business there is uh, really around Docker and uh, Node.js. And I worked also on the partnerships with Docker and uh, Kubernetes uh, recently. Uh, I will talk today about uh, log management, what is log management, what is performance monitoring, uh, have a view into Kubernetes and Swarm. And uh, yeah, they'll share the basic is the container logs and container metrics and show you some examples from the Swarm 3K monitoring. It was a community project where people spend nodes to build a large Swarm cluster. And just to, yeah, to explain the terms, what, what is centralized log management? Some people think they are storing the logs in one place is log management, uh, but there is a lot of work behind it. So one thing is you have to configure your applications to, yeah, to produce the logs in the right place. Uh, some store logs in a log file. In, in Docker, we have typically the logs to the standard output and standard error uh, streams. This means also you might change your application to log into streams instead of uh, logging to, to the files. Like, like Java applications typically configure to uh, store logs in a file, and if you want it in a container, you might change the configuration to store those logs uh, or, or simply write the logs to the standard output and standard error stream so it can be collected by uh, logging agents or logging drivers. Uh, then the second domain we have here is the domain of log shippers. Uh, there are well-known tools for it like Fluentd, rsyslog, or logstash. And what we do here is do log collections, we do log parsing, and we ship the logs then finally to a storage uh, system. And uh, especially the log parsing is, is, an, is a topic which is complicated, so developers like to store logs in a readable way, but for processing, it's better to store them in a structured way like having uh, JSON logs. Uh, the, the next part is having a system that receives those logs and uh, provide indexing capabilities so we can search in it, and we need the possibility to analyze it uh, with uh, different tools, for example, make statistics, how many logs we received from a specific application, or how many hours we did receive, or we have valuable uh, business information like transactions and, and the amount of transactions we won. Uh, in a uh, case of uh, need for troubleshooting, alerts are very important, like uh, forwarding alerts to tools li like PagerDuty. So this is the whole chain of uh, uh, centralized uh, log management and many tools involved. A uh, similar scenario for the monitoring. On the monitoring, it's even more complicated because uh, the yeah there are much more tools. I wrote a blog post about open source monitoring tools uh, for different tasks, and it was kind of mind map which is uh, not finished. You find it on uh, on my blog, and. Uh, Let's start with, with the uh, applications itself. The problem is some applications expose metrics, others don't expose metrics. If you take a regular web server like Nginx, it uh, is not configured to give you any statistics about uh, uh, the activity in the, in the web server itself. You can activate it in the configuration, then you have an endpoint that you can query, and then you get how many requests it does. Uh, and uh, some statistics about it. So first of all, you have to configure your application for it. And uh, the second step is then having a collection for the metrics. So somebody has to go to this endpoint, read how many requests we have, and, and store it somewhere. Uh, and at that place, we have uh, time series data. And there are many time series databases uh, that we could use in, in this place. Uh, and the, the main uh, task of it is to aggregate metrics. So if we collect every 10 seconds that we had maybe 1,000 requests, uh, we have to aggregate it over minutes, hours, and days, depend uh, what, what we like to see later on in, in our dashboards or in our charts. And uh, here is a, a strong relationship between uh, yeah, shipping the metrics and the time series database we use and uh, the aggregation of metrics and the visualization. 
Uh, it's really when you use one tool at the beginning of the chain, you have to use another tool at the end of the chain and some other tool in the middle of the chain uh, to, to get your results, your metrics, and, and being able to do alerts on it. Um, so this is, i show it just quickly, that the mind map of tasks that we have here, like, like tagging logs, collecting logs, and uh, on, on the top right corner, you see the different time series databases like Prometheus, Elasticsearch, InfluxDB. On the dashboarding side, you find tools like uh, Grafana, uh, Kibana. Uh, well, then for, for log parsing, we have tools like FluentD and different uh, log agents. And the question is really how to combine those tools together uh, to make a reasonable workflow out of it. Um, so this was about monitoring, and now a uh, few words about Kubernetes. Who, who knows about Kubernetes? A few users? Swarm? Anybody use Swarm? Okay, so I, I will explain a bit how it works. The, the concepts are quite different. So it's often mentioned orchestration, Kubernetes, Kube and Swarm, but they are not the same. Uh, Kubernetes has a concept of... Uh, uh, let's say atomic unit of deployment is, is a pod, which is a set of containers. And Kubernetes makes sure that the pod runs on a single node. So we have here defined uh, Kibana and Elasticsearch, two applications together in one pod for our Elk stack. And if you scale it, uh, a replication controller gets a message, okay, we need uh, uh, three of uh, those stacks and then it creates uh, three pods and makes sure that Kibana and Elasticsearch run together uh, on the same node. The networking between the two applications is a local network, so they communicate via different ports. And really the, the scaling unit is on, on pod level. And, and uh, Kubernetes would never distribute the two uh, containers for Kibana and Elasticsearch to different hosts. They would always run on the same host. Uh, th that's a big difference to, to Swarm, which can scale the containers uh, or distribute the stack over, over multiple hosts. Um, yeah, replication controllers, they, they, they are like uh, watching the desired state and the current state. So if you say we need uh, two instances of this pod, then we... Uh, yeah, the replication controller uh, checks the current number, and if this one is missing, it looks for a node which has the capacity uh, to run the second pod, and then it uh, starts the second pod on, on the node which has the capacity to do so. So that's why also uh, Kubernetes has some default, uh, let's say, limits on containers. It's always useful to set uh, like the CPU mi limit or memory requirement for containers and then it can calculate where is the sufficient uh, resource on which node to, to bring it there. We have some other things like it's called services, and this is completely different from swarm services. Services are, let's say, network endpoints where you can access your applications which are running uh, in the pod, and uh, we have daemon sets which are kind of uh, global installation of uh, applications. So when you define a daemon set, uh, the application will be distributed to every node. Yes, and, and Kubernetes has features like uh, uh, autoscaler. So it's really feature-rich. It is uh, more complex to set up and to get started, uh, but really it comes with many features inside. It has also some simple dashboard where you can see the matrix when you one, the, the Heapster tool and, and uh, no, uh, the Kubernetes dashboard. You get a simple view to every pod, what is the current resource usage, a simple view to the logs, and Heapster is also required uh, for the auto-scaling. So it can monitor the resources used by the applications and start new instances. So it's a great and full package. While uh, Docker Swarm is very simple, but uh, you have the Docker experience, you have uh, your well-known Docker commands. You got a few new commands recently with the swarm mode. And uh, you might work with Docker Compose, or uh, there are now application bundles. It's something new in Docker. 
and uh, this is different uh, from the uh, from the pod. You see the scaling unit. I marked this with a three on the Elasticsearch container. I can say in, in this stack I scale Elasticsearch to three nodes, and then it uh, happens that that the Elasticsearch might be started on one node and the second instant on a on a second node, and they are connected via overlay networks across the nodes. That's completely different from the thing that uh, Kubernetes is doing. Uh, uh, in, in regards of services, this is called a service in, in, in Swarm. Uh, it's more like uh, one container that you can uh, scale. So you have a Docker service command and uh, it defines a container and then you can say Docker service scale to five instances and then it creates uh, five of those. But, but the term is completely different than, than in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. That, that's a bit confusing when you look into both tools. Uh, so Kubernetes is, is not like Swarm uh, in level of functionality uh, and, and how it works. Uh, the common base is, is Docker, and therefore I would like to start with the Docker logs and metrics and, and the Docker API and give you some detailed examples. Um, for, for container logs, uh, there was a nice development of uh, logging drivers. So if you install Docker today, you get the default logging driver with its uh, JSON. Or on Core OS, you might get the JournalD as default logging driver. Uh, you have other options like syslog, fluentd, Splunk, or, or and they, they can work with TCP, UDP, and they ship the logs to, remote, uh, to a remote destination. Uh, if you store it in files, you would have another task, taking the logs from your local storage and, and ship it to a remote destination. This is a bit safer. You have your logs on your disk, and uh, log shipping is, is a separate task. So in worst case, you can always log into the node, SSH into it, and, and, and find your log files. While, while the shipping via network, you, if something goes wrong, you might lose logs, and the logging drivers nowadays are not uh, buffering or, or doing some advanced things in this regard. Uh, the docker logs command is able to retrieve the logs from the docker API. So you give docker logs and the container ID or container name. Um, with the syslog driver, you have to specify, of course, the, the options to connect to a syslog server. Uh, you can extract some information out of the docker API, like the image name, uh, the name of the container or the container ID. So the context is very important because later on you get logs for many containers and you want to search for something specific. You need to know some information about your image and, and application name. Uh, the, the problem with this command is when I run it, uh, yeah, it failed. So I specified it should connect. Uh, oh no, the docker logs command failed because the logs are not stored locally. So I, I miss now a feature. I use this log, send the logs via UDP. It's going quite fast. Maybe UDP lose some packets, uh, and I have no access to the logs on my local machine. A little disadvantage uh, on this logging driver. Uh, yeah, some more fun with it. When you use TCP, your container might not start because the syslog server is not reachable. You have a problem in your network, and you try to start your application. It's not starting up because something goes wrong in the network, and you cannot connect to your syslog server. It's easy to fix, of course. Make your syslog server available. Make the network connection available. But we know things uh, go wrong, and networks can break, or some configuration are simply wrong. Then you have a problem. Uh, there was an issue in, in Docker about it, so maybe in the next release they, they fix it and the container might start without having the TCP connection to the syslog server. On the other hand, you are then somehow in an undefined state where you don't know if you collect your logs or what happens to the application. Uh, yeah, what are the alternatives? And I'm working on the Docker agent and the idea here is we use the Docker API like the Docker logs command. So if the Docker logs command 
works, uh, a log collection agent should work. Uh, we get uh, the most complete information from the Docker API. Uh, we can retrieve logs, we can retrieve metadata of the containers, like the name or, or the image. We can even retrieve text of the containers. So if you have labels attached to the containers, this could be collected via the Docker API. Uh, if we use the, the JSON uh, file drivers or the journal D drivers, we have the logs on our local machine. So in worst case, we can access it uh, when, the, when the log uh, shipping to the remote destination fails. Uh, such an agent could also store information in a buffer when the remote storage is not available. Let's assume we ship the logs to Elasticsearch and uh, Elasticsearch is not available, network is broken, or Elasticsearch is overloaded, so rejecting the requests. Uh, we could buffer the logs on the local disk and forward it when, when the storage service is available again. You might also have different storage locations, maybe security sensitive information goes to, to one Elasticsearch server or um, other information goes to a second Elasticsearch server, or you have permissions to different indices on Elasticsearch. One uh, group of people needs to maintain database clusters, so they're interested in the database logs, while other people maintaining web services, front-end services, and, and they're interested in, in the logs of the front-end, so you might route the information uh, depending uh, on the application that uh, generates the logs. So such a smart agent can then forward the logs to different uh, destinations. Uh, another idea around the agent is, if we know here already which applications are deployed, why not pass the logs automatically in, in this place so we get directly structured data in, into Elasticsearch. And then in the remote destination, uh, we, we can then run applications to, to search, make analytics, or create alert and manage our access permissions uh, to the log files or to the log entries from the containers. There is even more. With the remote API of Docker, we can collect all additional information like labels, container names, images on Kubernetes, the namespaces, the name of the pod. Uh, in, in Swarm, we might have the Swarm service name or name of the Docker Compose project. And uh, if, if we are connected to the API, why not collect all the information we can get there, like logs, metrics, and, and Docker events. And, and that's a good base uh, for the visualization and building the correlations later on uh, to search for the information that we need. Similar stories about metrics. This is a bit faster now. Um, you have the Docker stats command. It gives you a little information about CPU and memory usage. And this is often not sufficient. If, if we look to the API, we have more than 70 metrics only for containers. Uh, it's very verbose, so nobody would query the API manually to find out some I.O. statistics about it. So we need an agent that collects this information and similar ideas around it. And I think you get the point. It is important here that we collect all the information from, from the API. We have the same story about forwarding the metrics to a time series database. Uh, we need also buffering here because if something is wrong in the network, we can still measure our the performance metrics of the application, and when it gets available, we can forward it. Uh, using the API, we can also do auto-tagging of metrics uh, to search them later on and visualize them. Uh, it gets a bit more complicated, and this is really the, the problem we have when we run different applications on, on such uh, orchestration tools. Uh, common uh, container metrics are easy. We can discover them, the containers. But uh, if we have an application like Elasticsearch, it has a specific endpoint for statistics about Elasticsearch, how many indices has it, uh, what is the, the query latency, and stuff like that. Uh, so when we start monitoring, we need to know how can we reach Elasticsearch, and we have dynamic networks. So we need some setup of it. 
uh, what, what people do today is uh, starting uh, Elasticsearch and do a custom container. And the first thing what this container does is it registers itself in the service discovery. Like it makes an entry in etcd. Uh, I'm running on this IP address, having this name, exposing these endpoints. Uh, and later on, you start a monitoring tool and you use the information you stored in etcd to configure the monitoring tool to collect the information. Uh, in any case, you have some work to add monitoring to your stack, like if you have the, the ELK stack running in a pod on Kubernetes, you might also add a monitoring agent in the same application stack uh, to collect this information. It's a lot of manual work. Some ideas around this, because we know what, what is running on Docker, which networks are used, which IP addresses, uh, all labels you attach to the containers. We could use the information to start application monitoring agents automatically. Like we see a new Elasticsearch container, we know how to monitor Elasticsearch. We know what is the network, and so we can connect to the Elasticsearch instance uh, to collect the metrics. That, that's the idea behind it using the Docker API to e retrieve all the information uh, we need to start application-specific monitors. Uh, because we have there are many technologies, this goes slowly. We made it for some applications. The initial prototype was uh, Nginx, so we started a new web server, and we detected it automatically and collected the metrics, and we continue to uh, make this for more and more applications. It, it gets more difficult if you need uh, some kind of authentication or a specific uh, configuration to, to access the application, and therefore it's really important that you look how is your application configured uh, to expose metrics, or maybe you have to add an additional tool uh, to get to these metrics, and that, that's then the more complicated part, and uh, I'm sure we cannot solve all those uh, problems uh, but for many applications, I think we, we can uh, reach a completely automated uh, monitoring. So have a look to the container matrix we could collect. Uh, one thing on, on Docker host, I remember the first days I started, uh, my Docker host was always uh, out, of, uh, out of storage because I never cleaned up the images. So you release a new version, and then you have some images on your disk that you don't use, so uh, clean up the images and, and, and watch the storage of, of your nodes. Uh, another criteria is uh, seeing how many containers we have running, and so you can uh, verify, for example, deployment strategies. Uh, in Swarm, you could say uh, there's one deployment uh, strategy called uh, pack or spread, and, and spread puts new containers on, on different nodes, and if you pack it, uh, it fills up the first node with, I don't know, uh, the containers that can run on one node defined by the resources. Like maybe you run 50 on one node, and when it reaches this limit, it, it puts another 50 on the second node. But with number of containers per host, you can easily see how, how this works. Uh, CPU quota, it, it makes sense to give quotas to, to your application. You have to figure it out. So what I did here, I was running a container with a 5% CPU limit, and, and you see that the Docker slowed down uh, the CPU usage. So if I would give it 6 or 7%, uh, I would be fine. And that, that's the big question when you define what is the resource usage of my application and what limits uh, should be defined. Uh, you can use the monitoring uh, to tune it. You set a limit of 5%, you see it, it's not, not okay all the time, uh, I should increase it. Uh, similar, uh, you can work with the uh, memory, and the interesting information we get here from the Docker API is having uh, out of memory or memory fail counters. This means your application tries to allocate memory which is not available because you have defined some limit, and then you get such, uh, let's say, out of memory events or the memory fail counter increases. A typical case is you give your container one gigabyte of memory, then you run Elasticsearch in it, and it tries to allocate uh, one and a half gigabyte memory. So we have to tune 
the application itself to the limits that you put on your container. So we choose the Java memory, so then uh, Elasticsearch would be ava uh, aware that, that it can use only two gigabyte or, or the one gigabyte limit. More information from Docker API is Docker events, so you can trace every creation of a container, uh, every uh, mounting of, of, of volumes, pulling images, and this is really interesting when you deploy applications. You see then the time it, uh, it needs to pull the image or, or start the containers, or you can see the, the status of, of the containers you have running. Uh, similar to Swarm, uh, Task status, this is information from a swarm cluster showing uh, the status of current tasks if they are running or just creating uh, or already stopped. Yeah, to summarize this, you can use the monitoring to define the right limits and this makes sure that your application can, can run with the right resources on your nodes. Deploying a monitoring agent, yeah, was a year ago it was a bit difficult, especially on, on Swarm. It had no global service command, and then there were some workarounds with shell scripts to deploy monitoring agents to every node, uh, li like doing a loop. I have five nodes, then I have to write a for loop to deploy an agent to, to, to every node. And, and with global services and the daemon sets in, in Kubernetes, it got really easy to deploy an application to, to every node to collect uh, the information on every server. So we're getting close to the end, and uh, this deployment of, of agents we tested then in, in the Swarm 3K uh, community project, and uh, our agent was then deployed to 4,700 nodes at the end. The requirement for us was to collect host matrix, container matrix, Docker events, and we did the task monitoring, and the plan was to reach 3,000 nodes. Actually, the, the test one did reach 4,700 nodes. We expected 150,000 containers, uh, but something went uh, wrong, and uh, so we reached an only 60,000 uh, containers during this test one. Uh, on this one day, we collected 28 gigabyte of uh, metrics uh, from the 4,700 nodes. So this was the pre-flight test. We did, of course, we didn't want to monitor 3,000 nodes without having a test before. Uh, the pre-flight test was doing very well, spinning up 500 nodes, starting 60,000 containers in, in five minutes without any problems. This was really great. Uh, on, on the Swarm 3K test, it was like, oh, we reached 3,000 nodes, and everybody started to, uh, let's add another 100 nodes. And uh, so it grows up to 4,700 nodes. And we see some gaps in the metrics. This was the point where one of the Swarm managers, there were sw three Swarm manager applications, uh, got a bit in, in trouble and uh, got, got restarted, and then the, the process of, of spinning up containers uh, slowed down. And we, we see also the, the number of Docker events on the bottom started at some point as there was a problem with, with the replication of the, of the status. Uh, from our side, we have also seen limits, like the people asked, how can I see the metrics of my host? And uh, if you have 4,700 nodes, you see your diagram like this, you, you cannot recognize anything. And so it's very important to group it somehow, attaching labels to it, and I think when we do again uh, such a large scale uh, test that, that it is very useful to have labels on it and, and group then the hosts uh, by labels to drill down uh, in, in the dashboards. So close to the end, I would like to say setup of monitoring agent is a complicated task. Uh, Simple container management uh, is, is one thing, but getting application metrics is still uh, needs a lot of manual work. Uh, 
if you look to Kubernetes and Swarm, they are quite, uh, quite different here. Uh, we think uh, Docker as common base is, is good to retrieve the most information we need for monitoring. And our vision is really having uh, smart agents doing collection of metrics, events, and logs, and labels, all metadata that we can get, also network configurations uh, to set up automatic monitoring. We, I think we are 80, 90% there, and especially the setup of application-specific monitors is something we have on the roadmap, and uh, Zimatex is hiring people, so if you are interested to work with uh, such systems and uh, collection of metrics and working on the analysis of the information and providing automation on top, uh, you are welcome to join our team. Thank you.